Well, I guess we are just uh, in time to start. Uh, I first uh, thank you so much, Mets, to accept our invite. And uh, Emilia, could you uh, start the event today? Okay, yes. And uh, I started just giving the word to our Vice Hector. Professor Takashi, uh, which is uh, the one who will present you, Matt. Takashi, can you uh, go ahead? Hello. Good morning for all. Firstly, I would like to say thanks for Colonel Matt to participate in our important Innovation Week at ITA. We are uh, waiting for your presential visit again here. Okay, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, Colonel Metz Olofsson retired from the Armed Forces in 2013. He has an Air Force background, big Air Force background, with uh, extensive experience from science and technology management, as well as uh, from systems development in the C2 area, a common and control. During the last seven years of activity duty, he has chief scientist of the Swedish Armed Forces with uh, responsibility for planning and execution of the overall research and technology program. He also led requirement studies for the new version of the Gripen fighter in which the Brazilian Air Force will use and for space related activities. Uh, Colonel Matt pro promoted, was promoted to Colonel in 19, 1998 and was then appointed as head of the Swedish Military Weather Service. From 2002, he has directly research and technology first at the National Defense College and since 2005 as a chief scientist. He holds a research exam uh, in atmospheric science. Uh, in my point of view, Colonel uh, Lofson can be a very important professor at ITA with <laughs> an in incredible uh, curriculum. Uh, Colonel Lofson is a member of the Royal Academy of War Sciences since 2005. And for then, he has recently led a project on the technological development in the digitalization of the defense. Since 2013, he, ha he is active as a consultant with focus on strategic research and development related tasks and support to government agencies and industry. His present main engagement is as a coordinator for the Swedish-Brazilian cooperation in aeronautics Research and development represent the governmental strategic research and innovation program in Novaer. So this is a very big and uh, important collaboration between Brazil and Sweden. Uh, even me, I have uh, two students in, today in Gothenburg, Chalmers University. Uh, using this important cooperation. I'm talking about our research, high-end research in the propulsion areas, aeronautical areas, in the postdoctoral and uh, PhD position. So for us at ITA in the Brazilian side, this uh, collaboration between two countries is very, very important in several, uh, several uh, areas, not only for uh, academic, but for our industry, our our space cluster in San Jose campus. Corona Olofsson will talk about a um, very important subject in our life, triple helix concept between the academy, industry and government, and the innovation in the Sweden. The Swedish strategic programs in which we are involved also, Professor Emilia talking about the event in the next year, week in which the Colonel Lofsson will participate. It's very important to our students and professor to stay in this event also. 
and Nover, the strategic program aeronautics. Uh, Colonel Metz, uh, I will give you the word. Thank you very much for your virtual presentation here. And I, we are very happy to, to have uh, this kind of lecture in this week, Innovation Week at ITA. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will just start the correct screen to share. <laughs> that it will be better. And then I will. Yes, yes. My yes. presentation. Working and I well. hope you can now see it. Yes, we can see it. Very good. Thank you very much for your kind words. And uh, I'm really excited to be able to give a lecture at ITA. I've visited you several times over the years and uh, has been impressed by all the activities you do from when we had the first workshop together in 2014 at ITA with uh, an enormous number of people attending. So I will today give a lecture of innovation and digital technologies as tools for transformation but from a Swedish perspective, of course, because that's what I represent. And now you said a lot of nice words about me, just uh, my background, I put in a few uh, bullets here. And uh, what is in a way essential for my connection to the Brazilian armed forces is what is said in the fourth bullet. I was lecturing at the CI CISP, executive innovation management course it was run for three years in a row and we had mostly brazilian army but also participants from the brazilian air force and it was really interesting to get to know more about your society and your armed forces at that time but since 2014 as it was said i'm now as a representative of the strategic innovation program innover which i will talk more about later on i'm uh, coordinating the cooperation between our countries in aer aeronautics. So I intend to give, let's say, a lecture on three items. The triple helix concept as a base for the successful innovation in Sweden. Then speak about the Swedish strategic innovation programs. There are more than Innovair. And then focus on the Innovair and also about our research program, NFFP. So, to start with the first one. Now, what is innovation? That's essential. If you are running innovation weeks, probably you have already this very clear for you. But if you ask different people, there are different descriptions. I just picked a few here from a Dr. Ken Hudson the creation, development, and implementation of a new product. And uh, from Harvard Business School, innovation is the successful implementation of creative ideas within an organization. So the word implementation is essential because just to have some ideas and just to do research is really not innovation because innovation is when you take that further on and actually you take it also further up the technology readiness level ladder to create something which can be used, then it's innovation. Now, this looks like I'm going to boost a bit about Sweden. Just a few weeks ago, the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is a UN organization, they every year announce what they call the Global Innovation Index. And this year's index was released on the 20th of September and Sweden again was ranked as number two in the world. The ranking is based, as it said here, on parameters such as degree of knowledge and technology outputs, infrastructure and human capital. What impressed the WIPO was that in spite of the COVID-19 crisis, investment in innovation had shown a great resilience and publication of scientific articles actually grew. You can guess it because all the researchers, they had to sit back home and write their articles and publish them, but it's impressive. 
Now I put up the results for Sweden and we are very proud of being number two and Brazil. And it's not to, to compare otherwise, but to show that the arrow in the end, that arrow is showing that you are actually, you are increasing your numbers here, going from 59 to 56 in the ranking. Or oh, 57, it says here. Anyhow, that's an important message because I can see that in Brazil, a lot of good initiatives are taken in the innovation area. Now you are a very big country compared to us. You are more than 20 times as big in area and 20 times as many people. But still you have a lot of very bright universities and people. So, with us as number two, how has Sweden managed to become innovative? Well, our Minister for Business, Industry and Innovation, he said the words that are written here. I can let you read it first. Now, the yellow marking is made by me because the collaboration between business, academia, civil society, and the public sector is what we can call triple helix. And that's why I take this as a starting point for triple helix discussions. This is one way to illustrate the triple helix. You work together and you create some kind of a cooperation acting between the three layers or the pillars in this triple helix, and you create something going up from the combination of us. So cooperation is resulting in added value for all the three parts, which I will come back to. Another way to see this, uh, and this is not my slide, it is see the advantages for the three pillars. Government, and you can read some of this, you know, already in the academia, you can have better research if you cooperate and get funding better education, more students, merits and centers of excellence. And of course, for industry, by cooperating with academia, they get access to the talents to be able to recruit them. And for government, it's very essential, as I will show, especially for Sweden as a small country. So the prerequisites for the Swedish position, and these are my words and my opinions, we are a very small population, a total of about 10 million. This means we are few people on every task. And if you are few people, you need to collaborate. And we have a very, I would say, very non-hierarchical system compared to almost all other countries I've visited. So people, even at low levels, they dare to take initiatives and dare to think and believe in themselves. And that creates a lot of more possibilities to, um, uh, to be efficient and innovative. We have a completely free education also at academic levels. And almost all universities are government entities. I don't know if that's an advantage for all countries. For us, it has been a way to, to say, guide the universities how they are uh, behaving. But also very essential is to see what is the background? If you look 70 years back, after the Second World War, we were neutral and non-allied for many years. To be able to be neutral, we had to create a possibility to produce our own military equipment, being self-supplied, and that was a strong belief for the politicians. So we were actually getting help from government to create excellent industries with a high technology level uh, I don't know if you know that, but during some years in the 50s and 60s, Sweden had the fourth biggest air force in the world when it came to number of airplanes, after only the really big ones. I think it was United States, Russia and France before us. And so of the supplier of Gripen and also of advanced submarines these days is a good example. I hope you're not disturbed by the little noise. I think that noise is when people are coming into the, to the conference. So the Swedish Armed Forces, because ITA is a military university, uh, I dare to speak about the Armed Forces. We have a number of equipments that are quite modern. 
Not all of these you see on the screen are Swedish made, but a lot of them from submarines, seagoing vessels, the stealth vessel, frig, uh, the, our corvettes, and small uh, seagoing vessels. We have, of course, our Gripen aircraft and also our airborne radar system. And we have a lot of army equipment and um, uh, army vehicles. So we have used innovation as a vehicle for the transformation of the Swedish armed forces. Why do we always speak about transformation? Well, globally, we have all the time changing societies and we have a very rapidly developing technology. It's very clear that in today's world, it's not the military technology that's leading. We are just number two or sometimes number three. It is the high tech global companies, some of them bigger than national economies that are leading the way. And we in Sweden, we had to change from national to expeditionary force and now back to a primarily national defense. We are thinking a lot about total defense, the mix of military and civil defense in order to take care of the whole society. But we also have the advantage of very innovative defense industries, IT industries and telecom industries like Ericsson, for example. We have had since uh, more than 20 years some key issues. We want to create a joint force. Our headquarters is, for example, combined and joined for all the services. We have a networked force built a lot upon our telecom structure. We created strategies for procurement, but also for R&D. And we are involved in a lot of international collaboration to survive as a small nation. Some drivers for our future defense capabilities. Well, security policy aspects and the political will, of course, they are the base. But we have also like examples like digitalization, including the very hyped artificial intelligence and automation. Something I speak about a lot, miniaturization. I think that has been a driver for a lot of the development. For example, the present Gripen being uh, so say exported to and also built now in Brazil, it wouldn't be able if we hadn't the miniaturization of all the computerized things. I have actually purchased or leased a new car, an all electrical car, and it's so full of computers. So I just hope it will work and nobody put an electronic shock wave towards my car because nothing will work then. Everything is miniaturized. And we, of course, we have the globalization for good and for bad, as we see now with the lack of um, uh, chips for all industries. But to create capability, we also need increased funding. Always we need increased funding, not the least for research and development. We need to create an engineering capacity. We need to have relevant education. We need to have good individuals and skilled individuals, and they get their skills through their education system. We need to have more and increased civil military collaboration and, of course, international collaboration. And the last one, I'm not always popular when I say this, but we have to counteract naivety among decision makers and the general public. Uh, if you speak to people out there, even the politicians, they are not aware about a lot of the things we know of in the academic area about how technology is developing and what you have to take care of when it comes to cybersecurity, etc. Now to ease this up a little bit because you are an Air Force part, I just want to show a small film of one minute. This is no speech in, but this is the latest film from the Saab cooperation with uh, Brazil showing something here. So please enjoy.
So when it says now season four is because Saab has produced a number of these true collaboration films. I will show one more later on. They are accessible over, uh, over YouTube actually. I will provide the link as well. So the next part of my lecture about the Swedish strategic innovation programs, something about the background and the status. Well, we have three Swedish funding agencies that about uh, 12 years ago got the decision from government to, well, they actually got the finance from government to finance a total of 17 strategic innovation programs in a number of areas. It will be the base for cooperation in areas of strategic importance to Sweden. They create the preconditions for finding sustainable solutions to global societal challenges, not the least the climate change problems, and also increase our country's competitiveness in the international arena. And once again, we see the three pillars here in Triple Helix, business, academia and organizations we join forces under the umbrella of these programs. And the, from the beginning, there were just six programs, but they grow quickly to 17. And I listed all the 17 here. You can read them and one is in red. That's the one I'm gonna speak more about, the aeronautical one. But I guess you can so say, see that there's a lot of new materials there is med, medicine area, med tech, smart cities, mining, and electronic systems. Everywhere where we have industries and activities already in Sweden, where we think we can do even better. So I will focus on the uh, Innovare, but first a few words about these programs. We had an, a number, actually an initiative to create R and I research and innovation agendas during four years or five years. That led the foundation for the innovation programs. The stakeholders in this area, in our case aeronautics, jointly formulated a vision and objectives and defined the needs and strategies. So Innovare was not uh, existing in 2012, but we started to work on such an agenda. The main aim is to address important social challenges, for example, the climate change problem, and create growth and strengthen our competitiveness. But of course, another country could just replace Sweden with their name and see if it suits their needs. A second period extended this with four to six years. And in earlier this year, an evaluation was performed and that showed a clear and positive result for the whole governmental initiative. So we were allowed to apply for a third and final period. They've said it's not gonna be more than three periods in this uh, costume, so to say. Overall is that the effect of the initiative seems to be of substantial and lasting value for Sweden. So much about the general innovation program. So I will move over to Innovare, our strategic program in aeronautics. Maybe you have seen this uh, logotype. It has appeared in many of the corporations we are doing with ITA, for example. They aim to coordinate and support the stakeholders from industry, universities, institutes, different associations, and of course, government agencies who are active in the aeronautic sector. And the Air Force is under the umbrella government agencies. And we are working according to the Triple Helix concept and has done so from the beginning. Now, what has been the result from a triple benefit? Actually, I can tell you that this slide, this image was created by a Brazilian fellow uh, who was working with us in Sweden at Linköping University for some years when we had one of our workshops, I think it was in 2017, to see how we can create a relatable, uh, relatable context 
strategy and effort are naturally aligned. For academy, you can grow a wider internationalization by cooperating, collaboration, of course, and you get access to funds. Industry can share their R&D costs, they get access to talents and market, and they create innovations. And for government, it's a more efficient R&D funding. It's the base of a knowledge economy, and we have the multiplicative effects. So, in summary, the long-term high-tech nature of the aeronautics R&D promotes low to mid TRL R&D and multiplicative effects. Since the universities are an essential part of this, we are mainly speaking now about low to mid TRL. So the Strategic Innovation Programme for Aeronautics was born from the first National Research and Innovation Agenda we created in 2013. We were invited from our innovation agency, Vinova, and paid to do this agenda. We did it as a teamwork, all significant actors, and we used this as a foundation when we then applied to be allowed to be seen as an innovation program. But all these innovation programs, they are co-funded by industry. Industry cannot just receive money, they have to chip in by themselves, uh, in kind mainly. With in kind, I mean the working hours, uh, resources for laboratories and things like that. So Innovare was established in 2014. And I love this. The picture on the front of our NRIA flug, flug means aeronautics 2013. This young lad, maybe in 10 years, he will be one of the researchers. But actually we had, uh, we had already created in 2010, what we call the National Research Agenda, NRA. That was the first issue. I don't show it here because it's the NRIA with innovation in it that we are now basing our activities on. So this um, 2013 iteration, it was followed three years later by the 2016 uh, version. And then in 2020 came out the newest one. And the last two ones, they were actually translated into English and are available on this. Um, if you make a quick note of that, but I also promised that the PDF of this presentation is available and you can ask ITA for the link if you are interested. It is probably much easier for you to read it in English than in Swedish. So, when we created Innovare, who are then the parties? Well, the government authorities like the armed forces or the Air Force as a part of the Armed Forces, the Defense Material Administration, and the Defense Research Agency. And different from in Brazil, these are separate agencies under the Ministry of Defense. They are not part of the Armed Forces. And then we have three funding agencies supporting us. Vinova, the Swedish Energy Agency, and FORMAS. Anyhow, all the Swedish universities with relevance in the aer aeronautics area are part. And we have today RICE, which is the Research Institutes of Sweden. They are actually the combination of many small institutes that uh, uh, were a bit scattered before, but now combined into RICE. Then Innover has helped to create two arenas, one for advanced composites and one for metals. And those are very much involved in many of our research projects and also in our cooperation with other sectors. The major multinational enterprises like Saab, we also have one in the Indian uh, area, GKN, which is actually a British company, but it, uh, they bought Volvo Aero, uh, producing the en engines for, actually modifying the engines for our previous fighters. And they are still modifying the Gripen engines when needed. We also have many small and medium enterprises and other interest groups in the Swedish aviation sector. So we meet regularly once a month in the Innovare group 
to discuss new activities. We stated in our agenda six prioritized areas of research. And you recognize all of these, I guess, and you have most of, if not all of these, also at ITA. Saab is mainly active in five of these when it comes to propulsion, it's not uh, an area for Saab, then it's GKN. But as you see, and as you know, many of these areas are general. It's not typically military or typically civilian, and they are needing input from many other areas like the electronics industry. And mainly we are focusing on TRL 2 to 3, although in the cooperation with Brazil, we are now aiming to climb a bit higher. Now, maybe it's very familiar to you or it's not at all. The TRL scale, I think is familiar, ranging from one to nine, where you are active in the lower part. But the other one, which we call the slanted wave, uh, if you are very familiar with it, you have to stand that I explain it a little bit. When you climb up this TRL ladder, it takes a long time if your aim is to create a fighter or a submarine. We used to say 15 years as the minimum to create a fighter from the initial research at universities until the industry has got the uh, fighter to sell. What this means, which is not uh, understand, understood by all the general public, is that we need to work with four or so generations of products simultaneously. So when we today start a new area for research for something that will be produced 15 years from now, we also have to work with the early technology uh, show, so to say, in the next uh, slanted thing here. I'm now speaking about this one. Then we need to go up to the demonstrator level where Somebody has to build a demonstrator to show that the technology that is based on the research is really working. And then industry can produce the final products like a fighter aircraft or something like that. But the industry has to work all the way. They are cooperating with universities. They are taking care of the early technologies. They need to build the demonstrators to cooperate around the demonstrators and to build the final product. And this is a real challenge when you look upon the IT industry and the mobile phones, the gradient of this one is so much steeper. So instead of 15 years, maybe it's 15 months between the generations. Another thing about the TRL scale, there are challenges. Once again, I put the slanted wave, time going to the right, and we have different parts of this scale for different actors, green industries, yellow government and red universities. So we start at university level, TRL one, maybe two, I should say also, but what, why I put it like that is that in universities, uh, most universities also have a general grant from government to just do, do uh, curiosity driven research. And that is a TRL one. Then when we come a bit higher, Government is there not to produce the research, but to fund it. So government needs to fund it through their agencies like the armed forces. And government needs to be active all the way up to demonstrators. And the industry takes over up to final products. Now we have a little problem here. And that is the economic challenge. If I try to point here in the basic low level TRL1, I don't uh, regard this as government funding because that's, so to say, driven by decisions by our government. Yes, but it's uh, available allocated money. But then comes the uh, special research, which is uh, done to requirements from government, more or less, or at least it's directed from those uh, money that they direct through the armed forces, for example. And then there is quite a lot of financing there. But when we come up to TRL4, then uh, this is not really what we can do from our R&D budget. Up here, we have the industry financing, of course, the product generation up in the end. 
but what is called generally around the world valley of death. That's the economic challenge for all of us to convince our funding agencies that we need money to take the TRL level a bit higher. Maybe that's not the main interest for you at ITA as a university, but uh, part of it is, and in our cooperation, we need to go a bit higher. Now, this was a lot of theoretical ideas, so I intended to show another film. It's not very long, it's slightly longer than the previous one, but here you have people, maybe even recognize some of them, who are speaking about the cooperation between Sweden and Brazil around the Gripen. Please enjoy. <laughs> Então, a parte do desenvolvimento do Gripen Biposto é uma parte que ficou muito atrelada à indústria brasileira. Então, praticamente, a Embraer é que vai liderar o desenvolvimento do Gripen Biposto. Então, a Embraer, em conjunto com a Saab e outras empresas que estão sendo beneficiadas é, nesse projeto de transferência de tecnologia, estão desenvolvendo conjuntamente com a Suécia o caça biposto. Esse avião biposto é exclusivo para a Força Aérea Brasileira, então o nosso papel hoje aqui é desenvolver o um avião de dois lugares para, para a Força Aérea Brasileira. A grande vantagem do avião biposto é treinamento. Então, inicialmente, ele vai ser usado na instrução básica e depois na instrução avançada, para que depois os pilotos possam fazer os voos solos respectivos na aeronave monoposto. Então, no futuro, na verdade, outros empregos, outras concepções podem surgir e a plataforma tal qual ela foi concebida vai nos possibilitar realmente adaptar ela da melhor maneira possível. Então, nós temos a opção do treinamento básico, do treinamento avançado, né, que seria antes do piloto fazer o voo solo na aeronave e outras opções futuras, caso a força aérea julgue necessário. Hoje em dia, nós já estamos visualizando um aeronave de posto não atrás para um instrutor, mas atrás de um operador de sistemas, porque são tantos sensores, são tantas possibilidades que o piloto em si não vai, ele não vai conseguir gerenciar tudo isso. Então, talvez um, um outro operador de sistemas lá na série traseira, ele vai trazer um ganho enorme num cenário de combate. So I think it's a very nice illustration to the reason that Brazil is now starting to build the Gripen two-seater out in Gavio Peixoto is that you are already a very innovative country with a lot of skilled people. And I know from my cooperation that Embraer was actually born from ITA in the early days. And there is a lot of advanced engineering capacity there. So it is interesting to see. Although this film, as you saw, uh, was filmed in Sweden, the flying sequences, because you could see some snow. But the first uh, Brazilian Gripen is flying in Brazil now. It has been performing. I've seen the images of that. And uh, you are soon to get the next uh, two Gripens to Brazil. So I'm going to continue with my last part now. Uh, the cooperation in the Swedish Armed Forces, the National Aeronautics Research Program that formed the base for Innover. And I tell this because it could be an inspiration also for a similar program in Brazil. It was initiated already in 1994, and now we are in the seventh instance of this program in its last years, hoping to be allowed to have a NFFP-8 funded by government. In the beginning, it was 50-50 when it came to money from civil and military authorities, but now it's more like 80-20. The reason being that the military had for many years got decreases in budgets, budgets, although I'm happy to say that last year they started to increase again. But another reason is that avionics and aeronautics is not so specialized anymore. It needs to take uh, input from civil society much more. It's a triple helix cooperation. It requires 50% in-kind funding. We include small and medium enterprises. Innovare is administrating the program, but industry is leading the projects. And we have a cooperation with funding from Vinova and the armed forces, with FMV, our Defense Material Administration, leading the 
in sharing the work and then with the two major industries. Okay, this slide is just showing to show you some names I think you recognize. Who is there? So organization from academia, we have Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, Chalmers, Lean Shipping, and several institutes, but we are also involving some more institutes and uh, universities today. Financial, we know about 40% armed forces, 10 and industry 50. And we have a steering group. And the idea with this program is that government is paying for the possibility for the industries to send people as an industrial PhD student to our universities. So they are paying all the costs there. And in the end, the industry is getting back most of these, some are remaining at the university. So this is another way to show it. We are funding the PhD students and their supervisors at the universities. We are expecting a PhD exam and industry is the project leader submitting most of the project proposals, but they are evaluated as any other call. And the outcome is new technology, industry, academia, cooperation and new researchers. And some results are high competence at universities, institutes and industry. We have managed to use this to gain business positions via the European Union demonstrator programs. Quite good, actually, we have managed there. And also when it comes to military programs, like we had the Neuron a Stealth Unmanned Vehicle, which we built together with France, it was just a prototype and a uh, research program, but still it was quite successful. And we also generated the knowledge essential for designing and producing GRIP and ECHO, as we call it, or GRIP and Next Generation, or as you see on this slide, on the tail of it is the Brazilian, and it's so nice so I enlarged this slide a bit. It's still flying over Sweden there, that was before it was, so to say, transported to uh, Brazil, but nowadays it flies over Brazilian environment. We have, so to say, in the NFFP came up with the idea, which I think is actually from the NFFP, was one of the research directors in one of the industries. He said, why do we only speak dual use? Why can't we speak triple use? So we created a project where we invited the uh, car industry, the Volvo Cars, which is a Swedish company, of course, but Volvo Cars together with Saab and GKN and our research institute Sverea, now part of RICE, they formed this uh, based on composite technologies. And it was quite successful. So we could share both costs and results outside the aeronautics sector with a high relevance to another sector. And actually today I see that the word use, uh, sorry, multi-use is used uh, abroad also, where you can add several other agencies. Benefits for the academia, up till the sixth instance, and that ended in 2017. And I, unfortunately, I have no access to pressure, but for the first six instances, we produced at least 110 PhDs. One third of these are working still at GKN and Saab. 30 are working at other Swedish companies. 35 remained in academia and 10 left Sweden. Do we regard this as a loss or as a failure that they are not all working at the Swedish aeronautics industry? No, definitely not. We think it's essential to get them out with their knowledge to other companies, to remain in academia, and even to go abroad, maybe coming back again. And for academia, it gave a better knowledge about the branch, a lot of networking with the industry, and a need-driven relevance of the R&D. And also gave them a quality label in cooperative programs abroad. 
benefits for the armed forces. Technology transfer from civil R&D, very essential. The methodology to meet the future requirements when we are to develop and the Gripen, other air systems and future modifications to the Gripen system. We have said the Gripen is our basic platform at least until the 2040s and probably longer because it tends to be remaining longer the big systems in the world around these days. But very essential is the survival, as I call it here, of national competence in order to maintain and manage our system of systems uh, platforms. It's critical for the armed forces. And then I come to my final slide. We are doing a lot of good work in the aeronautics sector, whether in Sweden or in Brazil. And we can see a lot of spill over to other sectors. And I name a number here where we have seen such spill over. And when we started to work in Brazil, our uh, growth, innovation growth agency, they created a report to see what was the spill over or spill out from the Gripen project and program in Brazil. And they could show quite a lot of essential spill out to other sectors. And it is one of the major wishes from our government and the Brazilian government in our high level group discussions. How can we create good things in our aeronautics sector that can spread out to other sectors and create more cooperation between our countries? And in all this, actually design and or manufacturing on composites has been a common factor, but also some more items. And by that, I would like to say obrigado and thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, we go now to the questions. Uh, I don't know if uh, the people has uh, any questions. They can put the questions in the chat. Um, but before that, I, I will make some questions uh, and, uh, and some comments. Uh, the first one is that I, I didn't know that the first strategic plan in aeronautics was from uh, 19, no, 2013. Uh, I swear that uh, in Brazil we uh, thought that Sweden had these plans uh, for, for, for decades and that we, <laughs> uh, mm. we didn't know it was the first one. Uh, actually, we thought that it was like... Uh, 10 or 20, uh, this, was, uh, this was a surprise for me. Uh, uh, one curiosity, who is number one in WIPO uh, ranking? Yeah, I thought you would yeah. ask, it's Switzerland. Ah, Switzerland. And, yeah, that's, and it's a uh, bit surpri surprising to me, but year after year they are in the top. And I think it depends on the same situation as for Sweden, they were not involved in the Second World War. In their yes. And a lot of economic resources in, for example, the medical sector. So Switzerland is there as number one in the world. But I have to comment on what you said. Yes, the first formal national research and innovation agenda was produced in 2013. In 2010, we had this, what you call the National Research Agenda, but that was not created on uh, order from Vinova. But as you could see from our National Aeronautical Research Program, NFFP, that started in 1993 and in 94. And in that group of people between the armed forces and our industries, we have had a lot of strategic work, a lot of documents to show what are we wanting, what do we need, so it's not that we didn't have the strategic work, and that was actually the real advantage for us compared to the other sectors in Sweden. They were so envious because we had this program running since 1993, and we could gain, to say, so much of just putting these resources together and produce our first agenda, which was uh, actually regarded as a role model for all the other agendas. Yeah. Um, one question is, you said that 
you plan to have three uh, periods of uh, uh, planning and not having it uh, permanent? Why not permanent? That is how Swedish government has decided it. They don't want to conserve those programs for the 17 areas. So now for the next one, they have started to discuss and they start to put together a study that we see what are the most essential areas in society to allow to have strategic programs in. It doesn't say that the present areas are disqualified. They might appear again, but there might be new areas which are more related to um, sustainability in society or um, could be related to artificial intelligence or people, the problems in, in uh, engaging everybody in the market to work or th things like that. I don't know, but that's what they said. They will stop after three instances with the same programs and um, open it up for a new, uh, yeah, some new ideas. Yes. And, uh... One uh, additional question is, in the beginning of your presentation, uh, you uh, mentioned that one thing that you think that uh, is important uh, for in, in, um, for Sweden to be innovative is that you don't have a high hierarchical society. And uh, we are, uh, part of the armed forces and uh, as part of armed forces, um, we are in a hierarchical system. Uh, ha, ha, but also you, you were part of uh, the Swedish armed forces. So how do you see this? Uh, do you see a conflict be between hierarchical systems and uh, like uh, being innovative or uh, what you can say about that? Yeah, what I can say is that in some of the previous Warsaw Pact countries of Eastern Europe, they still have such a very hierarchical system that nobody has the right to air what they think without asking some levels up. So it's very hard to get any answers. I can give an example also from the armed forces, definitely a hierarchical system. <laughs> I've been part of it since my early days. But uh, maybe you've heard of that our previous fighter systems, the Viggen and the Drakken, were serviced out in our road bases by conscript personnel. The conscript personnel were trained to service out there, and you could even exchange an engine in a fighter with conscripts and only a few uh, regular officers out there. And some of these conscript personnel, they were, yes, they were conscripts, but if they had good ideas, those ideas were often taken care of, leading to innovative improvements of the routines. The same in our universities, you heard of the CDIO method, which was, uh, I never really conceive design, yeah, what the other letters stand for. But that was actually MIT in the United States and Lean Shipping University and KTH who came up with that idea. And once again, you put people together, researchers, not in the top, not in the, the chief position, but by doing that, they can show their creations easily. And I think the same in society. And we regard ourselves as a non-hierarchical system out in industry also. But I can't say that it's um, counteracting innovation overall to have a hierarchical system, but I think it helps if you uh, really, you, you ask everybody to come with their contributions and you don't point at them if something is not so good. You support them, if that's an answer enough. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, if you want to, you can make the question in Portuguese and we can translate. That is uh, no problem. Akasha, I'm seeing you. Okay, yes, I have a, a question. Uh, first, I would like to say that I love the subjects about the strategic innovation program. 
in specific for aeronautics. At ITA, we working in the same uh, thing. Uh, research and technology is a vital partnership in the context of operational capability. We completely agree about your presentation. And the economical challenge, of course, because uh, when we are talking about technology and different technological readiness level, you have to think also with the economic of challenge that is not for uh, institution like uh, ITA, for example. This is a, a state project. This is a county project. Very good. Uh, and yes, we we work also not only the dual but triple and multiple uses of this technology. Sometimes it's possible to work in the bioengineering, for example, for robots or materials. This is very uh, important to use some techno technology developed for aeronautics and space, and we can use for automotive, medicine, uh, oil and gas also, and so on. Uh, but I have one, one question about the intellectual property. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure, but uh, do you have some advancements in Sweden or, or other countries, some different model? Because in general, this is a very big question to discuss between the uh, institution uh, of a research mm. development like uh, ITA, for example, and Swedish universities and the industry. Do you have some uh, advancements or some innovation in this area? Mm. Yes, I know from before because I was working with um, uh, IFI, uh, the, the group in San Jose's campus, and uh, you have a different patent system, a different IPR system than we have. One of the uh, answers is related to, I can see Paolo Lorenzao, you put a question here in the chat, give some more information about the industrial PhDs. Well, yeah. industrial PhDs means that uh, individuals from Saab, for example, they can be chosen on their merits, I should say. They are not accepted in a university if they don't uh, pass the academic criteria. But they can be accepted with salary during the time they go to the university. They don't have to go back and be students on, on lower uh, salaries, I should say. So they are there as industrial PhDs. They are not uh, tied to the company completely. When they are in the university, they are under the university rules when it comes to how they work in groups and so, and they produce things. Now in Sweden, we have an intellectual property right saying that the student in a university or a PhD students has the ownership of his findings. So if you have some kind of new invention, you put that in an article, you have a possibility to take a patent and then you can create a spin out company and you can be hopefully rich in the future. But with the industrial PhDs, that's a, di a bit different because if the industry is paying their salary while they are at the university, the industry can sign an agreement where they say, you are still um, a member or say an employee of Saab, for example, so when you are there, your ideas, you can bring back to the company so we can profit on in the future. And that's the different difference when you have an industrial PhD compared to when you have a PhD students just applying to the university for a PhD position. Because of course we have a number of PhD positions where government is securing a basic salary However, not the same as a, like a 35 year old uh, technician with an academic basic degree at Saab has got. So that's a difference when you have an industrial PhD remaining with their salary. Um, I hope that also answers uh, Paolo's uh, question about industrial yeah. PhDs. Yes, we have uh, uh, another question now. How, Paolo? Yeah, we are seeing you now. Okay. I don't know if you you can. I mean... uh... hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. We have another uh, another question now from uh, Daniela. Yeah. 
she asked, uh, I would like to ask how they are managing diversity uh, in the development of systems since new technologies involving software in the industries such as um, trying to read the yeah, I can read it, such as artificial intelligence introduces also diversity to bring broad contributions in the development yeah. of systems. Yeah, definitely. And that's one reason when aeronautics in the old times, that was pure aeronautics and was a bunch of people who were aeronautics only. If you look at the Gripen today, it's such a complicated system of systems. And especially when it comes into electronic warfare and sensors, extremely advanced with elements of top-notch artificial intelligence software industry. Of course, in a military industry or defense industry, for IP reasons, they cannot just cooperate with anybody. So they have to create their own groups within the company who are good in sensor technology and artificial intelligence. And Saab has that. But for smaller companies, you cannot afford to have all these groups. You have to cooperate. You have to sign non-disclosure agreements and so because artificial intelligence day it also requires a lot of data. And in Sweden, I can mention to you, we have two groups. We have the Wallenberg Autonomous Systems and Software uh, uh, Program, WASP, which is also involved in our Brazilian cooperation. And we also have AI Sweden, which is government funded. And AI Sweden has recently set up a lab in Gothenburg called the Edge Lab where they have a platform like an arena where they offer anybody who needs access to high level computing to go there to do their, for example, for a week or two to do their AI research. They can also get access to broad databases that they maybe haven't got themselves. But this diversity is definitely essential and system of systems the expression by itself says that it's not just a platform, it's not just a system, it's such a complex combination. I don't know if that answers your question, Daniela, but... Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, it answers. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I don't know if we uh, we are already uh, running out of time. I don't know if we have any other questions. Uh, if anyone uh, thought, maybe we can uh, conclude today. Uh, Takashi, do you want to okay. uh, close the session? And Max, uh, yeah, thank you I, very I, much. I have just a, a, a final question. This is a general question, okay? And uh, uh, Coronel Lofson, what do you think about the importance to now to insert the concept of ESG, okay, into the environmental, social, and governance issues, into the collaboration between R&D institutions and industry, to think about the future about the sustainability, uh, wealth, welfare, and so on. I agree with you that it, we have to do that. There are two reasons. One is that if people, our taxpayers, regard the military to only be bothering about their own business, we will lose their confidence sooner or later. The other one is that it is essential for all of us as individuals on this globe. And um, we have started in Innover to promote more and more of cooperation in um, the sense of, for example, fossil free new engines for aeronautics, beginning with the civil industry, of course. We recently got actually government and money, so of GKN and others will make a study how it will be possible to go the road to be fossil free. So that's one part of this to help create um, this 1.5 or at least two degrees, uh, less than two degrees than increase. So 
as maybe was said here early, my beginning in the Air Force was as a meteorologist. So I have a special heart in meteorology and climate modeling. And I'm very much uh, in contact with the climate modelers and their worry for the future. Um, we have to take IPCC's uh, warnings into uh, and, and understand it. So we need also in our work where we develop the next generation of our military equipment and research to include that. Uh, in our cooperation now with the uh, Air Domain Study, we have, as you know, maybe the ISR UAS. And one way is to, um, we have discussed now, to identify wildfires, for example, from unmanned vehicles, to stop the fires before they create enormous uh, damage to forestry and smoke that can be health hazards. That's one example where we can support society uh, in that roadmap. So I definitely think we have to keep that as a basic uh, driver for us in our cooperation. Okay, thank you very much. So let's uh, design new future military craft based on the hydrogen. <laughs> yeah. <Green> hydrogen. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much for your presence in this virtual lecture. Uh, the subject is and was very interesting for us because it's completely aligned with our thinking at ITA and our research and technology development here. Thank you, Emilia and Mariangela, for the organization. And uh, Professor Matt. <laughs> Professor Matt Lawson, <laughs> we, we are waiting for your presidential visit here to yeah. perform another lecture here, okay, for our students and professors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all, for everybody that uh, participated in this uh, time uh, and see you uh, in another lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you very thank much you very for much. having me. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Uh, I'm seeing Paulo Lorenzo yeah. also. <laughs> Our big friend, Paulo Lorenzo. Yes. <laughs> Sefrin, yeah. Pascoto, Aurelio Rossi. Very nice to see you here. Thank you very yes. much for the participation. Also, Sacani. <laughs> Sacani, yes. Our former, former dean. Yes, Sacani. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, Sakani and Paolo I've met in my previous yes. visits to Brazil. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Agora a Adriana <risos> fecha a reunião e derruba a gente. Gente, encerrando a reunião.